at another pastor's corner. We we are happy. Hope you had a um, restful holidays. Um, uh, some of you probably went to the beach. Some persons were involved in flying kite and lots of other things. Probably some of you went to the garden. But we are here this another Tuesday morning for another pastor's corner. We are delighted that you have joined us already. A number of you are there with us. Some of our regular um, um, viewers and followers. We we happy Sister Verona, Veronica, Sister Steadlins, Alicia, and others, um, Glenda. We are happy. Please, um, this morning, difficult Bible passages. Um, and we, are, we, we would like you to share the link. Um, like the page so that other, others of your friends can join in. Let them know that um, Pastor's Corner, difficult Bible passages. Um, we are going to look at it. And, um, and I'm quite sure, by God's grace, we will get the kind of understanding um, that God would have us to. So at this time, we'll, we'll have a word of prayer as we get ready to begin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another pastor's corner. We thank you for allowing us to be here, um, to share the everlasting gospel, to, um, to be directed by your spirit, to make plain what seems very difficult sometimes to understand. Enlighten our understanding and bring clarity to the word so that your children can understand what you want each of them to do. This is our prayer. We ask with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Um, this morning, we, we have no strangers to, to, to Pastor's Corner. We have persons who have been on Pastor's Corner before, and, um, and they are here with us. We have two gentlemen. Um, to my extreme right, we have the executive secretary of the conference, um, Pastor Oliver Scott. Pastor Scott also is responsible for communication and prayer ministries in the conference. Um, and sitting next to him, and that is to my immediate right, we Pastor Lambert Paul. Pastor Paul is the pastor, and pastor of um, the Western One District, um, comprising the churches of Clojure, um, Florida, Loreto, and Mongrambi at present. Um, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Pastor Isaac. It's a privilege to be with you today. Praise good, God. Mo good morning, Pastor. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. So um, we, we are dealing with the, the caption this morning, difficult Bible passages. Um, um, and already our viewers are there waiting and, and, and wondering what is it that those, what is it so difficult and what is it those pastors um, um, will be bringing out today? Well, of course, we are responding to um, questions, queries, and, and concerns of persons, persons, passages that that persons very often misunderstand, um, passages that persons have difficulties with. Um, these are some of the passages that we, we look at today. And uh, without any further ado, we'll get right into it. So <clears throat> let's go, um, gentlemen, with question number one. What does Paul mean by the expression, absent from the body and present with the Lord? The Apostle Paul made that um, that 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 statement in in a passage in Second Corinthians five six to eight. Um, so we want to find out what does Paul mean by the expression to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. I'll actually read the passage so that we know exactly uh, where it's coming from. So it's Second Corinthians chapter five, um, verses six to eight. I'll read. It says thus: Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home. In the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, um, that is where that phrase comes from. Um, verse 8 of Second Corinthians um, chapter 5. Pastor Scott, please help us, help our viewers to understand this seemingly difficult passage of Scripture. Uh, thank you, Pastor Isaac. Um, Pastor Isaac, you will have to indulge me this morning um, because in order to, to explain um, these verses, we'll have to look at some of the verses before so that the proper context can be gotten. And wonderful. We'll allow that because we don't want to give any, um, you know, fly-by-night explanation. <laughs> so yes. so we, we teach that to properly understand. You read those before and after, and if that's what has to be done, we will we'll surely allow that. Go ahead, Pastor. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so if you look at the previous chapter, for example, 
um, Paul alludes to the, to the resurrection in verse 14. He says, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Paul, as a believer, had a great longing for the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that he can be with the Lord and he can dwell with God in his presence eternally. So this is the context of, of Paul's words here in chapter 5. His longing desire to be with the Lord, to be glorified with the Lord, to be in God's eternal kingdom as against being here in this earthly life. And all of us as Christians must have that same desire. In chapter 5 from verse 1 it says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, meaning a tent, so he's likening our human mortal bodies to that of a tent. A tent is, is temporary in its use, and so too our existence right now is, is temporary. We have, Paul says, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So Paul is likening our immortal existence when Christ comes to take his sins to that of a house. Not a tent, but that of a house, eternal in the heavens. So there's a contrast between the tent and the permanent house. The tent is this earthly body that can die and perish, and the house is our eternal eternal existence in God's eternal kingdom. In the second verse, Paul says, For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. So, so that's Paul's desire, to be in heaven, to be in God's kingdom, to have a house, a glorified existence. He says in the third verse, If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle, meaning this earthly body, do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So Paul's desire was that he moved from a state of mortality to immortality. Nakedness has to do with, with death. So not that Paul really desired death mm -hmm. to be unclothed, but rather he desired to be clothed with eternal life in God's kingdom. He says, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. We're coming closer. Now he okay. that had wrought us for the self-same thing is God, who also had given us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are Always confident that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So while we are at home in this earthly sphere, in this tent, in this mortal existence, we are absent from the Lord. We, we cannot be on earth and in God's kingdom at the same time. Mm -hmm. So by the time we get to verse 6, he says, therefore, sorry, verse 7 and 8, he says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident. I say, and the willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So Paul's desire was not to remain in this earthly realm, present in the body, but when he's absent from the Lord. But rather, his desire was to be absent from this earthly sphere and to be present with God in his kingdom. That takes place at the resurrection. And so that was Paul's desire, to not be in this earthly body where he's absent from the Lord, but rather to be absent from this earthly body and to be present with God in his kingdom, which will be his reality when Jesus comes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, um, Pastor Scott. Now that you have said that, Pastor Paul, um, does, I mean, that, 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 that phrase, because I, I keep coming back to that phrase, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, does that have anything to do with what, what, what today people um, term astral travel? Pastor Paul, you can be sitting here and, and you have a friend in the U.S. and something can leave you absent from the body and be present in the U.S. Um, does, that, does that have anything to do with that text? I mean, th this idea that, that something can leave a, a human being and be someplace else um, living over there, talking to someone. Does, does this text have anything to do with that? Well, basically, as you look at the text, the text has nothing to do with that. In other words, um, as you look at the Bible, the only person who is omnipresent is God. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. God, God can be everywhere at the same time. No human being can do that. Um, additionally, um, something that the text is not saying as well, that when an individual dies, that immediately that person is present with the Lord in heaven. No, because as you look at Paul's writing, Paul always consider uh, or knows that, that death is um, asleep. So when an individual dies, which becomes absent from the body, um, which might be the state, which is the state of death, it does not mean that that person immediately, immediately goes to heaven. All right? So I just wanted to clear up that as well. And there is no, no individual who can leave, leave their body in Grenada and travel to New York and speak with somebody in New York and while their body is resting in Grenada. This is impossible. All right? The only person who can do that, or being, I would say, is the Almighty God. All right? So I, also get that, I want us to get that clear this morning. Well, of course, God. Uh, that, that, thanks for that. God doesn't have to do. The, God is God is omnipresent. He's He's everywhere at the same time. He doesn't have to. No, he doesn't have to leave anything to 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 go to someplace else or anything has to leave him. He is God. The the mystery of 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 God. We can't understand it, but God is every place at every time. Yeah, He's in St Andrews. He's in St George's. He's in New York. And good morning, Brother Desmond. Um, thank you for your greeting. Good morning, Sir Brenda. Yes, we are viewing, and good morning, Sister Decima Bartholomew. Good morning, Pastor, she says, and thanks for, thanks for all what you're doing. It's such a blessing to me, and I know it is for many others. Have a blessed day in the Lord. Thank you so much, Sister Decima, and God bless all of you. Um, Sister Kersha, is it? Kersha, you saying good morning, and Glenda, um, Nicholas, all of you viewing. Wonderful. Just keep sharing the page, liking the page. And um, so that others can get the clarity that is needed in, in these, um, some of these passages, which seems very nebulous sometimes, um, difficult to understand. But um, God has his people everywhere, and uh, we are always happy to share. And um, Pastor Scott, you want to add something else? Yeah, yes, ahead. yes. And um, j- just to add um, to what Pastor Paul um, indicated, um, when a person dies, the text is not saying that the person goes into God's kingdom immediately. Because because there is death, um, and and when we read the text, the text likens death to that of being unclothed or being naked. So so what, once we are alive, it means we are clothed. If we are alive in this temporal state, it means we are clothed with with the tent. And when we are alive in God's eternal kingdom, we are clothed with that permanent building. But when we are unclothed, it means that 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 we have faced death. And of course, the resurrection takes place after death. So it is awaiting the resurrection that will see the saints of God in his eternal kingdom. Wonderful, wonderful. So we, 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 we're getting someplace, um, um, you know, putting things together, the understanding. And um, um, we, 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 we're getting there. Thank you, Pastor Scott. Thank you, Pastor Paul. And we, we're moving on. We're moving on. Didn't the apostles say... What? Meat does not commend us to God. Did the apostle say that? Okay, he said that. So so the person is asking, does that mean one can eat anything? No, the apostle did say, meat does not commend us to God. So the interpretation for that person is that, does that mean, well, they're asking the question really, does that mean, an account of what the apostle said about meat, does that mean, we 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 can eat anything, you know. Uh, does that mean that? Well, let, let's see where the apostle says that. First of all, in in First Corinthians eight and verse eight. Again, this is a passage. I suppose we just can't take like this. But um, and there's also another passage in First Corinthians ten twenty five. But we we'll take um verse um chapter eight, First Corinthians eight and verse eight first, and then we look at um verse um First Corinthians ten twenty five. It says, "But meat commended." commended us not to God, for neither if we eat, we are the better. Neither if we eat not, we are the worse. Now, what, the, what, what on earth is the Apostle Paul saying there? Um, and, and so maybe, maybe we can also, let's just go um, also to, to 1 Corinthians 10, 25, and, and, um, and, and there we can, we can just you know, have a have a look at that passage as well. It says, "Whatsoever is sold in shambles or in the market, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake." So, First Corinthians, um, 
8 and verse 8 and 1 Corinthians 10, 25 seems to be saying something, Pastor Paul and Pastor Scott. Um, is, is it, my question is, is it a license? After reading those two passages, <clears throat> can a Christian conclude that the Apostle Paul was saying, don't worry, anything that you, that you are given to eat, just eat it. Don't, don't ask no question. Possible you want to you, like you want to uh, All right. First. Well, um, I, I and I will always use that as my baseline. Whenever we are answering a question, we look at the the holistic theology and the holistic doctrine of the Bible. Okay. I to lead to the topic. Um, so just a quick, I'll make a, a reference to a, a few texts quickly. Um, from Genesis chapter seven, when God created and He was about to carry the animals into the ark, they were both they were both clean and unclean. Mm. So we know that from creation they were clean and unclean animals. Right. I, I will get to the text. Additionally, um, when God instructed the children of Israel um, in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, he said what they should eat and what they should not eat. And sometimes people have an issue, why always the children of Israel is not for us? Remember, the children of Israel had a responsibility according to Isaiah chapter 49 and Isaiah chapter 42. They were light to the Gentiles. So when God addressed them, they were not to keep the messages for themselves, but to share to the rest of the world. So when God said what they should and should not eat, it was not only for them, but was for the rest of the world because they had to teach the other nation and infect the other nation with the gospel or the experience with the true God. Coming down now into the New Testament, um, I saw somebody said that doesn't the Bible say bless and eat? So I, that was the next text I was going to. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, it says, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Well, this just cover what I said because sanctify means to set apart. So if you need to see where it is set apart, you need to go to Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, and then our prayer can be answered. So we don't pray to bless anything. If it's blessed, it's blessed. And if it's cursed, it's cursed. If God doesn't bless it, then we cannot bless it. Now, going to the text for, for um, today. Yes, I want you to... Yeah, comment. that's the text I'm going to mm -hmm. now. So based on what we have discovered, it cannot be clean and unclean for, for, for a fact. Because the Bible, based on the references that I have made to the different scriptures, God does not endorse eating unclean food. So let's see what the text is saying. In 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 8, um, basically the topic there was about idols. In verse 1, you can see that. Noah's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffed up, but clarify, edify it. So basically, this topic there was about whether the animals were offered to idols or not. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, um, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other god but one. Because basically, when you look at an idol, idol is basically sometimes made from wood or stone or metal. And in the in 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 in, in a in in sense or uh, basically in this object or this material, there is no power, there is no life. So there is no life in the piece of wood, there is no life in the steel, there is no life in the stone. So they used to offer their food to idols. Pass you wanna have something? No, I'm listening. Right, good. Attempt, good. <laughs> nice. All right. So basically, that's what the issue there. Um, whether you should eat it or not. Um, Paul was saying nothing is really wrong with that in it because the idol have no power to do anything to the food. But there are some people who had concern with food that was offered to idols because it was aligned to a practice by the Corinthians. And the Corinthians was a, was a place that was infected and, and, and uh, influenced by many different religious practices. So, so now he continues in verse 9. Now he says, but take it lest by any means this liberty of yours become the stumbling block to them that are weak. So what the Apostle Paul was saying, don't, don't just eat the food that was offered to idols because you can do it. Because you know that nothing is really wrong with it. Because somebody who might be looking on, this person might be so innocent. But they thought to themselves, but if you are Christian, why are you eating food offered to idols? But you know as a Christian who is seasoned and, well and who understands the world well that, the idol really didn't do anything to the food. But somebody seeing you as a seasoned member, an experienced member, partaking in that, they say, nah, something is wrong. As a okay. result of that, you will cause them to fall away. Okay, All wonderful, right? wonderful. And let me just share the last part of, of the text. I want to share that part as well. The first Corinthians chapter 10. Um, you can read it in the New Living Translation. It says, here's what you should do. Take any meat you want that is sold at the market don't ask whether or not it was offered to idols. 
But let the answer hurt your conscience. So the, so the issue there in the in discussion of, of the, what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat was not whether it's clean or unclean because it was a Jewish nation. So they was not discussing whether the food was clean or unclean because they would not have unclean food in the market for sale. So what they was concerned about, they was being um, influenced by the practice of idol worship. So they were concerned about that and not whether it was clean or unclean. All right. Wonderful. Notwithstanding that wonderful explanation, but we, we want to hear from Pastor Scott. Pastor Scott, is, you know, the two passages have any connection, you think? Um, you know? yeah, yes, d definitely. Um, the emphasis of chapter 8 is Paul speaking to, to the believers. Mm-hmm. And uh, however, the practice in, in that context, um, not so much of the believers per se, but in terms of the world, was that persons would offer, as Pastor Paul rightfully said, um, foods or meats to idols. But an idol doesn't have any power. We are more powerful than an idol. An idol was made by man. So if you eat food that was offered to an idol, it doesn't take away from you, neither does it add to you, because an idol has no power. Okay. And so, th that's why the text is saying, but meat commended us not to God, n for neither if we eat, are we the better, neither if we eat not, are we the worse, because an idol has absolutely no power. So Paul is saying this to the believers. It was not referring to unclean foods. Um, clean foods were also offered by, by the Gentiles to idols. And so it was not about unclean foods, but it was about foods offered to idols. So nowhere does this text suggest mm -hmm. that you can eat unclean foods like pork and the rest of it. But it is really saying... Speaking to the issue of foods offered to idols, you may eat or you may not eat. It doesn't make you better. It does not make you worse. So, so even before you, you continue, Pastor, so Michelle Langain is listening with great intensity um, to both you and Pastor Paul. So she says, therefore, my question is, if I eat pork um, and I'm a Christian, does that mean I'm going to hell? She's, she's almost... I suppose getting into this, well, it doesn't commend you to God. So if pork doesn't commend you to God, is she say, is that what the text saying? She wants to know if you eat, if you're a Christian, eat pork, if you go to hell. Yes. So 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 the point is that the text is not referring to pork. Okay. All right. The text is not referring to unclean foods, but the text is referring to things that were offered to idols. So the issue of of pork um, is not to be discussed within the context of of this passage. However, we know from other biblical passages that pork is unclean. Mm -hmm. And so as a believer, we have to live our lives in harmony with the word and the will of God. It's not for me to sit here and determine who's going to heaven or who's going to hell as individuals. But the point is that as Christians, we have to live in harmony with the word of God. But in terms of our immediate passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, nowhere in the passage is it referring to unclean meats but it is referring rather to meats that were offered to idol. Because an idol is powerless, Paul is saying that whether you eat or not, it does not commend you to God, neither does it make you worse. Now, I, I, I want to look at the other verse that you mentioned, Pastor Isaac, because it's going to help a lot. Um, yes, First Corinthians um, 10, 10 and verse 25. Verse 25, it says, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles or in the marketplace, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Again, it has to do with meat offered to idols. Um, but some persons would try to use this text to make the point that you can eat any and everything because you don't have to ask any question. Right? But of course, they did not need to ask any questions because these were clean foods that were offered to idols. Um, when we look at Proverbs chapter 23, verse 1, the Bible makes it very clear that when we're in a setting and we really do not know what has been there, what has been served there, we need to ask, we need to inquire. So in, in, in Proverbs 23, verse 1, it says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. Okay. So the Bible is not saying that we must be careless and eat anything that is said before us. We must be careful and diligent with what is said before us. However, in 1 Corinthians 10, the folk were aware that these were clean meats, 
however they were being offered to idols. Wonderful. And, and someone was just asking about verse 27. Um, um, and, you know, it's the same context. You see, to understand the word of God, we first need to get the context. Everything that is said is said in a context. The prime minister gives an address to the nation or... Or uh, something of that nature, the, we first have to get the context because someone can say the Prime Minister said or, or this person said, the Governor General said, but what is the context? So, um, in the context of what was just explained by both Pastor Paul and Pastor Scott, if you, if you, if you be, if your conscience would be tormented, um, understanding the same reason that was given, you're in the market or you, you're at someone's house and meat offered to idol and you, if you know it is offered to idol, that will torment your conscience. You see, that's in the same context. The Apostle Paul says, don't, don't, if you ask the question, and then that will be a problem for you to eat. He said, don't ask the question. You see? Because once you ask the question, and that is not asking whether it be pork or, or, or mutton, because he's not talking about unclean foods. He's talking about clean foods offered to idols. But if you have a problem, your conscience, you see, if your conscience says something to you um, and it's so educated and you go against your conscience, then to you it is sin. So are, in that context, the Paul, was, Paul was making the statement in verse 27. So he's not saying, um, as Pastor, Pastor Scott just said, that you, you go on um, to the market, you go to a, a, a feast, and, and don't ask if it's pork and just eat. Don't ask if it's lobster, just eat. No, the Bible is not saying that because the Bible is not... That passage is not referring to clean or unclean foods, yes? Um, so I, I think we're very, we're very clear in that. Um, and, and yes, um, Marlene, we're happy to have you. Um, pork is unclean, and the Bible says don't eat or touch the carcass. And, and that's, that's, that, that is so. Good morning, Pastor Bess and, and all of you who are listening and following the program. Well, we are going... We are going well, but time is also running away. So we want to pause at this time just to, um, just to bring down the temperature and soothe our soul with a wonderful item of special music. And, and this morning on Pastor's Corner, we'll hear the voice, the lovely voice of Sister Cindy Hosford. Um, Sister Cindy Hosford. Share for me. 
Thank you so much, Sister Hosford, for that beautiful rendition. The blood. There is indeed power in the blood. And, and over the years, the centuries, um, the song is saying the blood has never lost its power. And it will never, ever lose its power. It has the power to save. And even today, I'm Pastor Scorner. You are out there. And, and the blood of Jesus can reach you and, and, and change your life forever. We are, we are back and we are happy to, to welcome, if you are just joining us, we're here in Pastor Scorner. We have Pastor Oliver Scott, um, Executive Secretary of the Conference with us, and Pastor Lambert Paul, uh, one of our district pastors. And we are looking at difficult Bible passages. We've looked at a few already. And um, we continue. We continue. Um, lots of you, happy to have all of you um, um, in, um, on the social media platforms, in the various platforms who are with us. This morning, this afternoon, we are happy for all your comments. Can't take all of them, but we we noticing you, and um, we are delighted that you are sharing with us. Now, someone someone asked here, pastors, can you please explain Revelation six nine to eleven? And we'll read it and we'll seek your explanation, which describes souls under the altar crying. The question is, does that mean dead people can talk? Um, there is something about um, that passage in Revelation that. Is causing persons to believe that if someone is dead, they can they, they can talk because it says there were souls under the altar crying. Um, let let me before we go to Pastor Scott, let me just read the passage here in Revelation chapter six, verse nine to eleven, and the word of God says, "And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God." And for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow men also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. The question is, um, does that mean dead people can talk? Because John, Pastor Scott, he's, he, he was in vision, and he saw souls under the altar crying. Please help us. Yes, and again, Pastor, please indulge me because I'll need to take my time to, to explain it. Okay, okay, and Pastor and Scott, we want to make sure you have the <laughs> proper explanation. Yes, yes. So, go ahead. And um, and you, you are correct, Paul, I'm sorry, John was in vision. And as Bible students, we know that when a prophet is in vision, that oftentimes the vision is given in symbolic expressions. And the book of Revelation 
is saturated with symbolisms. And so we have this taking place in these verses that you just read. And, and, so, and so the idea of souls under the altar crying is really an, an expression um, to make a certain point. So for example, you know, for example, someone's um, mother might be dead. And, uh, and that person might be making bad choices, bad decisions, behaving badly. And somebody may use an expression like this. Y your mother must be turning in her grave right now. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that expression? Of course, of course, yes. Your mother must be turning in her grave right now. The person does not literally mean that the person's mother is in the grave turning. But it's a point that, 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 that says what you're doing is really extremely against what your mother's wish would have been if she was alive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's an expression. And so we have that um, taking place, place here where the persecution is so great and the saints have this great longing for being in God's kingdom and receiving their reward. And as the persecution continues, that expression um, is being used to, to, to make, to make the, the point that the, the persecution that is taking place you know, is additional reason and, and gives additional emphasis and impetus to the saints desiring to be in God's kingdom. We, we, see, we see that affirmed in the other verses that you, that you read, Pastor Isaac. For example, verses 10 and 11 says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So, expressing a desire to overcome the persecution and to be part of God's kingdom. And then verse 11 gives hope for saints that will later on be persecuted. It says, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and the brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So the expression is used to give hope and encouragement to the saints who would later on face persecution that just as it is assured that those who died under persecution would receive their reward, so too you will receive your reward. But the Bible does not contradict itself. Throughout the Bible, we know when the saints would receive their reward. The saints receives their reward after the resurrection. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for example, tells us, that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. And the, talks about the dead in Christ shall rise. So it is after the resurrection that the saints will be taken into God's kingdom and they will be able to speak and be, be conscious. But this is a symbolism that gives an expression to make a point. We see it also in, in Genesis chapter 4 verse 10. Right? Um, and there are a number of passages like that, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to read one of them. Um, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10. Um, permit me to just read it for you. Okay. Um, it says, and he said, what hast thou done? He's speaking to Cain. The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. It not, it's not that the, the blood literally cries. But it's an expression to make the point that God is going to take avenge for his faithful. And that is the point that is being made in Revelation, that God is going to avenge the blood of, 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 of the faithful. So as if um, the souls are crying for that justice. Um, another way we can know that it's not a literal cry, it talks about the souls of the saints being under the altar. Right? Under the altar. Mm -hmm. now, now, that's hundreds and thousands of saints that lost their lives for the sake of Christ. So, it's not a case where thousands of saints are under one little altar. Right? So it's, it's, so, it's symbolic. Symbolic. It's, it's making a point. And, of course, the saints, they have sacrificed their lives for the glory and for the honor of God. But it's not that you have thousands and thousands of people on the one little altar. It is really symbolism. Okay, wonderful. So, so Pastor Paul, we are saying in Pastor's Corner this afternoon that, um, you know, 
in heaven, there is no altar in heaven where um, saints are crying, talking, people who have died. Um, you know, because, you know, you, you go to funeral services and you, you, you hear persons talk about your loved one. She's now looking down. And you, we are saying this morning in Pastor's Corner, there is no place in heaven where dead people are, are, are crying or are talking or, or any such thing. Yeah, well, it, there, is, there is nothing like that happening in heaven where, because basically, um, when an individual dies, they do not go to heaven. Um, because something strange about funerals and theories and so on. Um, recently, I was speaking to one of my family members, and um, they were making reference to my mom, and they were saying um, something about my mom in heaven. And I was like, who told you that? And then they say, well, um, that's what I heard people are saying. Because apparently, everyone who dies, they always looking down at us. That's the theory. Everybody who dies, whether you are a Christian or not, a drunkard, a thief, it doesn't matter who you are. Once an individual died, they're always looking on us. That's the theory. But the Bible does not teach that. When an individual died, they go to their grave and they wait until the resurrection. So there is no group of saints, a uh, 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 um, group of saints in heaven crying out with, uh, uh, under some altar for God to vindicate or for God to, um, to, to bring the, the, the act, how they were killed to bring it to justice. No, there is nothing like that happening. So we have to understand, and this is very important, that we understand the Bible in context and we do not take everything literally, especially the book of Revelation. There are a lot of symbols in the book of Revelation. So we cannot just read the book of Revelation and take everything literal because this will, this will lead us into some great misunderstanding. Okay, um, ju just to pause to, to you know relate to some of our uh, viewers and listeners. A random guy says he's confused. Why are you confused? When someone die and their soul goes back to God, well, I'm not sure where you got it from. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the spirit goes back to God. Now, the question probably we want to ask, what is the spirit? You see, um, a soul, you know, a soul is a, the soul that sinneth shall die. A soul is a person. Right here in Pastor Scott, there, there are three souls. Um, Pastor Scott, um, Pastor Lambert and myself, yes? So when someone dies, the spirit goes back to God, you see? And what is the spirit? The life, the life-giving aspect of, 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 of what, what, what we are composed of, yes? Um, we have the breath of life. That goes back to God because that comes from God. Um, so when, when, when Cain died, well, of course, he was murdered, um, the life... The, the, the breath of life went back to God. So it's not literal, um, my friend. It is not literal. And, and you say God is powerful over living and dead. So I think the text is literal when God made the statement about Abel. No, well, it's not what you think, not what I think. What is? So um, as Pastor Scott rightly said, it's figurative. It's, it's, it's a personification of, of what your, the blood of your brother is crying. Um, the blood, blood cannot cry. Um, God was as God was essentially saying, your brother should be alive. It's because of your wickedness why he is not here. Yes, God was making a statement um, to that. Yeah, um, so so I I I am hope that that is that is clarified. Someone is going back to a, a question. Um, something that we dealt with, um, Pastor Lambert. Um, let, let's just read that text for in Genesis Genesis one twenty nine and thirty. Um, just, just you can read that. Just in relation to eating anything, I suppose they just want some clarification there. Um, even for time is run away, but we just read that text, Genesis one twenty nine and thirty. All right, and it says, and God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the earth, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fall of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth. Wherein there is life, have I given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And basically, this text is saying that from creation, God's intention for man was not to eat flesh. So God, the, the Bible is saying there that God said, I have given you the herbs, the man I have given you that to eat to human beings, we should have been eating greens alone. And then he said, the beast, the beast should have been eating greens alone. So the lion, and they should not be tearing the other animals apart. This was never God's intention. So this text is not saying anything of, um, of God giving any creature for man to eat. He's saying the, the creatures and, the, and human beings 
all of us are critters, so human beings and the animals that you are created, all of us, we should have been eating only green hub, that, that, as he mentioned in the scripture there. Okay, and of course, um, Pastor, you want to, Pastor Scott, you want to say something? Yes, d- definitely. Um, t- two things, at least. Um, in, the, in the Old Testament, well, when we use the King James Version, um, the word meat is an old English word for food, mm-hmm. right? So in, in Genesis 1, when the Bible refers to, to meat, it is not referring to flesh, but it is referring to plant-based food. But meat is an old English word for food. And, and what it talks about as meat or as food, it talks about the herbs and, and these things. Now, if you examine the question that is asked very well, um, it says in the context in which it was written in regards to eating everything that creepeth upon the earth. Now, when you look at the verses carefully, the verse when it talks about things creepeth that creepeth upon the earth, it is not referring to these things as food or as meat, but it is saying that just as God has given the plant-based food or the plants for man to eat, so too God has given it to the other creatures. That could be. So, for example, if you take a time and you read it, it says, "And to every beast of the earth." And to every fall of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for food or for meat. Wonderful. So it is not saying that, it, what it's saying is that even these creatures were given the green herbs for food. As well as mankind. Meat. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. So we had some further explanation there, some clarity. Given um and, and your text, so we have some questions, and we also had um some of what you asked, and we seek to give um um clarity. Oh, time is run away, I tell you, and pastor's gonna time move so quickly. Um, pastor, I'm confused. If the dead cannot speak, how do you explain First Samuel 28, 15 and 16? Someone is saying, I'm confused. You're saying that the dead cannot speak. Well, how do you explain First Samuel? 28, 15, and probably 15 and 16. Let me just read here. Um, Pastor Scott and Pastor Paul. And Samuel said to Saul, Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am so distressed for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answered me no more, neither by prophets nor nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me, what shall I do? And verse 16, Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, that is become thine enemy? Now this is a scenario, Pastor Paul, Pastor Scott, where, Old Testament scenario where Paul, sorry, where, where Saul went to what we would say, a, 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 a voodoo person, a witchcraft person, an obia person, and ask that person, um, to, you know, the witch of Endor, to bring up a particular person. You know, bring a person back to life. And, and she did her simidimi, you know. And, <laughs> and some, uh, something apparently came up. And, 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 and you know, and, and he, he said, he, actually he asked the witch of Endor, who do you, who do you want me to bring up? And, and he, he said, as the king, Saul, he said, I, I want to speak to Samuel. The prophet who is now who is no longer there, the prophet Samuel, and that thing that came up, that apparition that came came up, um, you know, it it says though was, was it was it was it Samuel? If it was Samuel, Samuel was dead. Um, and the Bible says, and Samuel said, Pastor Scott, help us, help us, and Pastor Paul, I'm not sure who would. All right. Well, basically, what is happening there, uh, from the onset, it was not God. All right. It was um. It was the act of the devil, and I will say that uh, of the bat, because um, the reason Paul, um, Saul, and the, the, the contradiction is Saul and Paul, because we think in New Testament as well, um, Saul, uh, the reason why he went to the witch, which should have been killed, because God um, requested that all who practice necromancy and witchcraft and so on, all the witch and them should have been killed. So Saul going to her was not following God's leading. That's one. Um, the reason he had to go to Samuel because God was not speaking to him anymore. So if God is not speaking to you and you go to God's prophet, who should communicate with God before they can communicate to you 
How can that be God? It was not God. So basically, what was happening there, the, um, Samuel, um, quote-unquote, was invoked from the grave, but it was not Samuel. It was the devil that impersonated Samuel because the devil knows everything about us. He knows the way we speak. He knows the way we dress and everything. So it was not Samuel. And the, the being that came up spoke to Saul, and, and, and Saul thought that it was really Samuel, but it was not Samuel. So basically, the, the, the dead cannot speak to us, but the devil can impersonate dead people, and they can speak to us, and we think that we are talking to our dead um, parents, our family members, but actually we are communicating with the devil. Quite interesting. Pastor Scott, do you have anything to add? Yes, and uh, God um, had forbidden his followers from dealing with persons who were involved in necromancy. Right. That's, a, that's a big term, Pastor Scott. Necromancy. <laughs> what does that mean? Necro necromancy has to do with the idea of persons relating or attempting to relate to, to the dead. Yeah, trying to talk to the, the yes. dead. Okay. okay. And, and so God had forbidden that. That was not to take place. And so if God would have forbidden this from taking place, then God will not contradict himself by using that same means of necromancy to communicate with Saul. God has forbidden it, and so therefore God will not use it. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Yeah. Now, Samuel was a man of God. The, the, the man of God is not going to be submitting to the will of the devil, or one that is being used by the devil, who is involved in necromancy. So therefore, that being that apparently came up was not Samuel. How do we know it was not Samuel? In verse 14, it tells us Saul perceived that it was Samuel. Mm -hmm. So the Bible made it very clear. It was a perception. You know, for a lot of people, what they perceive is like reality. Mm -hmm. It is not reality. But they perceive, but, but they perceive it. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so Saul perceived that it was Samuel, but it was not Samuel. And so therefore, the idea then to answer the question directly in terms of of Samuel speaking. The truth is that Samuel was not speaking, but it was a spirit, a demon, who manifested himself as Samuel, who was speaking. And the devil does that repeatedly in order to s deceive persons. Yeah. The Bible is very clear that a dead knows not anything. And so therefore, God does not contradict himself. Wonderful. And, and um, we probably will have to get ready to end on, on, on this note today. But um, it, it's, it's so important, pastors, um, because this is a, this situation that keeps replaying itself over and over again. Um, the issue of persons believing. Listen, you cannot be a Christian, you cannot believe in God and going to the obia person to see how your light burn, burning. You cannot go to witchcraft and voodoo persons to see what's happening with you. It, well, I mean, I mean, it would not be God, you see? And that's what happened there. It would not be God. Um, I, I remember speaking to two young ladies, um, two young girls, they were secondary school students, and they, they said, Pastor, it's my mother. She had done the same dress, the same, you know, and, and I, had to, I had a great difficulty trying to explain to them. They believe it was the voice, the mother who visited them. They loved their mom. The mom, the mom passed, and, and they, they just couldn't agree that the lady who visited them sometimes during the night is not the mother. Um, but but some people believe that. Many persons believe that. So we're saying here um, this this afternoon and Pastor Scorner that what the Bible, the scenario that the Bible painted there in in First Samuel chapter twenty eight. Um, first of all, it was Saul going to the witch. A witch is led by an evil spirit. A witch is not led by God. So you cannot go to a witch, an evil person, and get something from God. God does not speak to witches. And um, so that that is very clear. I, I today it was just wonderful. We hope that we were able to um, clarify many of the issues that that you you have um, the, many of the thoughts that are still nebulous. Some of the ideas, the theories, and we we you, you, I I did read read some comments, and some of you saying yes, we need to do that more 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 teaching and less preaching. Um, well, preaching or teaching, the fact is that we are communicating the word of God. And I, maybe we need to listen a little more. Um, I, I, I get you a little more explanation would do. And that's what we try to do every Tuesday um, at 11.30 here on Pastor's Corner. So we, we thank you for 
for for being with us. We thank you, Pastor Pastor Scott and and Pastor Paul. And just just to close closing comments and any of the issues as you both of you closing comments this morning. All right, I just um I, I thank God for the opportunity to be here and to share the word of God. I just want to encourage us to study diligently. And if there is a passage that seems to be difficult um, to you as an individual, don't fear to challenge yourself and the power of the Holy Spirit and just dig deep in it, into it. And um, if you have a pastor or a spiritual leader that you, that you highly um, value, you can question him on the topic and see how you can be edified because at the end, you don't want to be misled, but you want to follow the word of God. So may God continue to bless us as we continue to study his word and stay close to him. What I would say is that the Bible is very consistent, and so the answers to what may appear to be challenging are always found in the Bible itself. And so we need to take the time to be able to read through the Bible, read the different verses of the Bible, read and understand the context um, of the passage that we're looking at, um, because the answer is in the Word of God. What appears to be difficult, the answers are there by virtue of studying the Word of God. Thank you so much, Pastor Scott. Thank you so much, Pastor Paul. And, and all of you today, a wonderful audience. We thank you for staying with us um, another Tuesday. Remember, we have a rebroadcast of this um, program at, at 8 p.m. this evening. Um, let your friends, those who missed it, or some of you missed it, missed half of it, you can take it again. You can look at it in your spare time. And we'll be back, God's willing, next Tuesday for another Pastor Scott. God bless you, and keep on keeping on. Let's pray as we close this program. Father, we thank you so much for um, leading us through another Pastor's Corner where we discuss um, diffi difficult Bible passages. We thank you for the clarity that you brought through Pastor Paul and Pastor Scott. May we continue to um, be used to edify your people um, so that many more persons can come to know you for whom to know is life eternal. Thank you, Lord, and dismiss us now as we um, close this broadcast. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. God bless you.